Thank you for joining today's program, Fecal Immunochemical Test, or FIT. What is it and how best to utilize it? Presented by the Nevada Cancer Coalition. We present this webinar with funding from the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health Colorectal Cancer Program. This webinar features Dr. Sam Narani, Associate Clinical Professor at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. Dr. Narani is a board certified gastroenterologist practicing at Digestive Health Associates in Reno. His focus in the practice is for all aspects of interventional procedures, cancer staging, cancer resection, control of complicated bleeding, and advanced pancreatic and biliary procedures. Dr. Narani, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, the whole purpose of the FIT test is to identify individuals who have the potential of having a cancer in their colon. So the colon is also known as the large intestine, so we're looking for colon, rectal cancers. Those uh, two words are used interchangeably. But essentially, the whole purpose of a FIT test is to identify colon cancers. So the objective of this talk will be to discuss what a FIT test is and what does it screen for, how does one perform a FIT test, and what to do with the result of the FIT test if it returns positive, and how do we use this test uh, to best treat a patient. Next slide, please. So what is a FIT test? A FIT test, by definition, is a fecal immunochemical test. It tests the screen for colorectal cancer, and it's developed as a direct measure of human hemoglobin. So if the colon has signs of blood within it, whether you see it in the stool or not, this test will be able to pick up the source of that blood. So um, if a colon cancer or a polyp is secreting blood, then this test will be positive. Next slide, please. So what about a colonoscopy? Because everyone thinks, okay, well, why would we do this test when we could do a colonoscopy, which directly looks inside the colon uh, and then identifies polyps, identifies the cancer? Why wouldn't we do this? It sounds like the best choice. Um, however, access to a colonoscopy is an issue. Uh, it requires a lot of different things. You have to do a bowel preparation. Uh, you have to have access to a gastroenterologist. Um, there are a number of different barriers uh, before you can get a colonoscopy. And our goal is to screen as many individuals as we can, um, as quickly as we can, in order to get them to uh, having a colonoscopy. And the FIT test is one alternative method for screening for colon cancer, which is what we're discussing today. The next slide, please. So what do we do uh, to do and perform a FIT test? Um, essentially, we're giving a, a laboratory um, sample a test kit, essentially, to the patient. And then stool is collected by the patient. And it's not a large amount of stool. It's essentially just a smear, so it's very easy to collect. Um, the stool is then packaged in the materials that are provided to the patient, and then that stool combination um, lab test is then put into a package and then mailed to a lab to be tested. Uh, so it's very easy to do, but the effectiveness of the test can be decreased. Um, if the patient you know, swipes the stool and puts it on the, on the kit and then lets it sit on the counter for a number of days, and doesn't mail it right away, that can decrease the effectiveness, decreases the sensitivity of the test. And what could have been a positive test now returns negative because uh, they didn't um, perform it as indicated. So there's a lot of different barriers to this. If they expose it to high temperatures, it can, it can interfere with the effectiveness of the test as well. The biggest thing to remember regarding the FIT test is because we're testing for blood, things have to bleed and we have to have uh, bleeding in the particular stool that is uh, sampled. And so when a colon cancer is bleeding, it's not like it's a massive rush of blood. It's literally a drop of blood, maybe every, every hour or every day. So we're not going to, we, there's a potential that we could miss when it's bleeding and potentially miss that cancer. So because of that, we have to do this test every year. And this is in contrast to doing a colonoscopy where we can look directly into the colon. And in that setting, because we're visualizing the entire colon, we know with certainty 
if there's a polyp, it's removed. If, it's a, if there's a cancer, we see it, we biopsy it, we identify it. Um, the accuracy is much higher with a colonoscopy, and we don't have to do that as frequently. But with a fit test, because you're looking for a very minute amount of blood, it, this test has to be performed yearly. You can't let uh, the patient go two, three, four years because the first test may have missed the, missed the colon cancer, so we would hope that the second one will catch it. So that's why it's very important to perform this yearly to make this a good test. Next slide, please. So how does the FIT test compare? The advantage of the test, it's a single test. You have a bowel movement, you collect a smear of the stool, and um, you're done. You send it in, you're done. Um, you don't have to have any special bowel preparation. And what I mean by that is for a colonoscopy, the patient has to do an extensive bowel preparation. They have to clean all the stool out of their colon. It requires dietary changes in order to get the colonoscopy. Uh, so the FIT test doesn't have to do that. You just have a bowel movement. Everyone has a bowel movement. It's easy. Anyone can do it. It's easy to, to smear the, the uh, stool sample on the test kit, easy to put into the mailbox. Uh, it's very, very cheap. It's about $50. But again, the disadvantages is um, if it's not done yearly, you can miss a cancer. Um, and despite the fact that we're testing for blood, again, if the blood is not being secreted at the time of the smear, then you can miss a colon cancer. You can miss a polyp. And unfortunately, um, this test will miss about 20% of colon cancers in patients, and it'll miss 70% of polyps because most polyps don't bleed. It's just the more advanced polyps uh, that bleed um, that we can we can um, detect. So, not the greatest test, but uh, definitely the advantages outweigh the disadvantages as long as we adhere to the guidelines of doing this test on a yearly basis. Next slide, please. So from the patient perspective, they go through the FIT test, they collect their stool, they smear it on the kit, they send it in, and then they get the result back from their doctor. The doctor says, oh, you know, your FIT test is positive. So what does that mean? If the, positive, if the FIT test returns positive, it means that there's blood in the large intestine, but that doesn't mean that the blood is coming from cancer. It just means that there's something in the large bowel that is secreting blood. So that can be a cancer, it can be a polyp, or it can be a number of other things that can cause bleeding within the, within the colon. So ultimately, further evaluation is necessary. Next slide, please. So if it's positive, patient needs a colonoscopy. We need to identify where that blood is coming from, what the source is, and then deal with that appropriately. So if the fit returns positive, a colonoscopy is required to, to identify the reason for the blood loss. Next slide, please. So who does colonoscopies? Um, a lot of different doctors do colonoscopies, but I do caution you uh, when you make referrals to look for the doctors that are gastroenterologists. Now, these are the doctors that have been trained. That their entire training is to do these procedures. They don't do surgeries. Uh, they don't do. Um, they're not family practice doctors. They're not internists, where a majority of their training is related to other um, aspects of education. Their education, their training is entirely endoscopy and what to do in situations like this. So gastroenterologists have the most training, they have the best experience, and most importantly, they have the best outcomes. You really want to choose the doctor that has the highest rates of um, finding polyps, finding cancers, providing the safest examinations, as well as having the highest fecal intubation. Um, in the next slide, we'll talk about what that means, um, but just to reiterate, a number of other types of doctors, surgeons, internists, attempt to perform this procedure, but they don't achieve the high marks that gastroenterologists achieve. Our societies, our, our boards require us, gastroenterologists, to have very high standards. Uh, we have to perform the procedures um, with a very high marks. We need to examine the entire colon over 98% of the time. 
we need to find a polyps in patient a certain percentage of, of the time. We need to find polyp the cancer is a certain percentage of the procedures that we do. And we have to track how safe are we doing procedures. The other physicians, they don't do this. They just do the procedure and hope for the best. Um, we track all of these markers and making sure that we meet these guidelines to provide the best um, procedure and best outcomes for our patients. Next slide, please. So what is a colonoscopy and what is a sequel intubation? I made reference to that earlier. Essentially, at the very bottom of this slide, you see the anus. That's where we begin for the procedure. Uh, we enter with the scope. Of course, the patient is completely sedated. Um, they do not feel a single thing prior to the procedure. They have already gone through a bowel preparation, so the colon is completely clean. There's no residue. There's no stool. There's nothing inside the colon, not even liquid. And so while they're sedated, uh, completely comfortable, uh, we put in the scope. We go um, into the rectum, around the sigmoid colon, up the descending colon, across the transverse colon, down the ascending colon, and then into the cecum. And that entire examination is what a colonoscopy is about. And the reason I discuss cecal intubation is that it's very important to take a picture inside the cecum and document that we have, a, we have reached the beginning of the colon. Like I made reference to earlier, a lot of other physicians who do these procedures have a lot of difficulty because of lack of skill achieving cecal, achieving cecal intubation. They may get to the middle of the colon, have a lot of difficulty, and they'll just sort of stop and then pull the scope back and look for polyps and only examine half the colon. And, and that really does a disservice for our patients. So very important, we get all the way to the beginning of the colon, that's the cecum, and then carefully retract the scope, looking at every fold, looking behind every curvature, and then looking for polyps, removing them, looking for cancers, biopsying them, and then giving the best outcome we can for our patients. Next slide, please. So what is a polyp and what is a cancer and how do those two relate? So on the left side of the, of the, of the screen, um, this slide, you notice we say hyperproliferation. Basically, there is a change that occurs in the tissue of the colon in the mucosa, that's the, the topmost layer of the, of the um, lining of the colon, there's a, 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 there's a change in the cellular structure, the DNA, that causes aberrations in cell growth, aberration in cell division, and then small polyps will form. And then those polyps, if left unchecked, if left unidentified and are not removed, they start becoming larger, they grow. And as they grow, the DNA abnormalities that are already within them becomes, become more severe, and they start developing dysplasia. And that's a precancerous polyp. That dysplastic effect that occurs is even more unstable. The genetic structure in the dysplasia is even more unstable, and that's when things can get really out of hand, and then you form a cancer. So a cancer will then form within the polyp itself, and then if that is not removed, then it starts invading into the wall of the colon. It becomes invasive and then highly malignant. And these are the things we want to avoid and prevent by doing these um, screening methods. Next slide, please. So here we have a very nice picture on the left side of the screen. That's a polyp on a stalk. In the middle of the screen, we have a device called a snare that's basically um, lassoed the bottom of the polyp right at the stalk. And on the right side of the screen, you notice that we have completely transected, cut through the stalk, and removed uh, the, uh, the polyp that was identified. Next slide, please. So a polyp or a cancer was found during the colonoscopy, now what? So 99% of polyps will be removed during the colonoscopy. This is what we're trained to do. Uh, some polyps, unfortunately, are very, very large. Sometimes they're invasive. And then they'll, those type of polyps are more difficult to be removed by your standard gastroenterologist. And those polyps will be then referred to someone like me, uh, who will then do a more advanced procedure to resect them while uh, they are still in the colon to prevent the patient from having an unnecessary surgery but sometimes the polyps are so invasive, uh, we do need 
to refer them to a surgeon. Um, if a cancer is found, then it's biopsied, and then based on the location that the cancer is found and subsequent imaging, like a CT scan and, and other labs, the cancer will then be staged, and the patient will then either be referred to a surgeon or an oncologist uh, for subsequent treatment. Next slide, please. So to summarize, a fit test screens for colon cancers and polyps if they are secreting blood. The fit test is an easy test. Uh, the fit test is not a perfect test, so the test must be repeated yearly to avoid missing lesions. If the fit test returns positive, then a colonoscopy is indicated. And who does the colonoscopy the best? Gastroenterologist. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me. Uh, this is a very important uh, subject. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Narani. Thank you.